will begin now, everyone. Good evening, my name is Paul Donnelly and I'm the Deputy Director of the Chow Chapman Museum at the University of Sydney. I'm speaking from Gadigal land and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and of the land from where you are listening. I pay respect to elders past, present and future. It is my great pleasure to introduce Associate Professor David Pritchard, who has been my good fortune to call David a colleague and friend since 2000 when he was engaged to write the script for the 1000 Years Olympic Games exhibition at the Powerhouse Museum, where I was a curator. David had just then submitted his PhD, and over the 20 years since, he has carved an illustrious academic career in the world of classical history. David is Associate Professor of Greek History and Discipline Convener of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Queensland. He's obtained 13 fellowships in Australia, Denmark, France, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and the USA. From 2019 to 2020, David was Research Fellow in the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Lyon. He is the author of three books, two edited books and 60 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. Testimony to both David's reputation, research and his persuasiveness, he has to date obtained the equivalent of $1.7 million in research funding. Associate Professor Pritchard speaks on the radio and regularly writes for newspapers around the world. I've been asked just in terms of housekeeping to let you know that tonight's talk can be viewed with closed captions with a live transcription of the presentation if anyone requires it. David's talk is on victory in the ancient Olympics and receiving kudos. What was the point of victory in the ancient Olympics? Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Paul. So let's see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna now try to um, uh, share the screen. Hopefully it will work. Okay, so looking pretty good. So I just need to find the slideshow. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can see the screen of my PowerPoint presentation now. Please let me know if it doesn't come through. It's a blue screen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with you tonight. Thank you so much for that kind and generous uh, introduction. And indeed, uh, it was a great thrill that um, you invited me to work on the Powerhouse Museum exhibition on the Ancient Olympic Games. It was certainly a job that changed my life. Like the many people listening tonight, I am a huge fan of the Chowchak Wing Museum. It is a fantastic museum. It really is an enormous contribution to the cultural life of Sydney. It is a real feather in the cap of the University of Sydney. Finally, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I feel your pain about the Sydney lockdown. I, I know the Sydney lockdown myself. I have a wife and an apartment in Chippendale the campus of the University of Sydney. I've been following this, you looked at very carefully, it has affected uh, my life as well. Let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, the delayed Tokyo Olympics will soon begin. Many are understandably asking whether Australia's sending of the Olympic team is really worth it. The Australian government spent, and I hope you're sitting down, the Australian government spent a mind-boggling $340 million on our team for the Rio Olympics. The gold medals, the 10 gold medals that we won at the 2016 Games was one of our worst ever results. Each gold medal cost Australian taxpayers $34 million. We are on track to spend a great deal more on our larger Olympic team in Tokyo. It is not just the money that is a concern about the 2020 Olympics. We are doing all this, of course, during, need I remind you, during a once in a century pandemic. Some ask whether the hundreds of millions of dollars might be better spent on vaccination programs against COVID-19. It is not even clear that sending an Olympic a team to, to, to Japan is safe. Australia is not alone in spending staggering sums on Olympic teams. For example, Britain now spends four times more on elite Olympic competitors than it does on sport for school children. In the last 20 years, many other developed countries have copied Australia's heavy spending on elite Olympic sport. This is the main reason why Australians no longer win so many gold medals. 
Such state subsidization of Olympic teams is hotly debated. For its part, the Australian Olympic Committee, the AOC, tirelessly asserts that the benefits of Olympic gold are, quote, obvious and significant, unquote. But others claim just as much and just as strongly that such benefits are illusions. For these critics, such state subsidisation is highly questionable in an age of cuts to public spending, not to mention during a pandemic. It wastes scarce public money that would be better spent on doctors, nurses and teachers. What is needed in this real hot debate is a careful an analysis of those obvious benefits that Olympic gold brings. Ladies and gentlemen, the ancient Greeks competed in Olympic games for 1000 years. They had clear views about what the benefits of victory in the Olympics were. By studying these ancient Greek views, we can get insights into what gold medals might do for us. Nevertheless, the treatment of Olympic victors by the ancient Greeks has also been the subject of hot debate. Apollos, a city-state, gave citizens who were victorious at the Olympics free public dining and free front row seats at its own games for life, so extraordinary awards. These honours were otherwise only given to victorious generals and other significant, benefit, other significant public benefactors. The great classicist Leslie Kirk, who works at the University of California at Berkeley, the great classicist Leslie Burke famously argued that the granting of such honours to Olympic victors was part of the so-called economy of kudos, which Kirk believed was a magical power that an athlete gained forever in his victory. For Kirk, a Greek city-state honoured a victor as generously as it did because of his willingness to use his kudos, his willingness to use his magical power in support of the state's military campaigns and other foreign policy ventures. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, in the last several years, Apulheria Kuriaku, a Greek uh, ancient historian, among others, has called into question Kirk's famous theory. We now know that kudos was not a power that a victor had forever. It was instead the fleeting help that a god or a goddess had given a sportsman during his agon, during his contest. Moreover, alternate explanations making better sense of the evidence can be made for the roles of, of victors in the ventures that Kirk highlighted. Tonight, this short public lecture seeks to explain a city's honouring of a victor, victor, uh, victor in terms of his victory's political value. The Danish ancient historian Thomas Heiner Nielsen has put beyond doubt that each Olympic athlete competed as a representative of his polis. Therefore, the Olympic victory of one of its citizens gave a city of no importance, rare international prominence, and one that was a regional power, proof of its superiority over its rivals. The only other way that it had to raise its standing was to defeat a rival state in battle. Therefore, I'll argue tonight, Apollos judged an Olympic victor worthy of its highest honours because he had raised its standing without its need to take to the battlefield. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the highest honours that a Greek state could give a citizen was sitesis, that is free dining in the Prytaneion. The Prytaneion, if you will, was the town hall of an ancient Greek city. Classical Athenians made a lifelong grant of this maintenance in what was their premier public building and the symbolic heart of their city to those fellow citizens who, who had gained an athletic or equestrian victory at one of the four recognised Pan-Hellenic Games 
games that were staged every two or four years on the Isthmus, and at Nemea, Delphi, and of course, Olympia. So importantly here, the Olympic Games were one of four Pan-Hellenic competitions in the ancient Greek world. The earliest evidence of Cetesis, free dining for Pan-Hellenic victors at Athens, is a so-called Pritoneion decree, which is dated on epigraphical grounds, it's dated on, on, on the basis of the shape of the letters on the stone, to the 430s BC. Fresh debate on this really fragmentary inscription took place throughout the 1970s. And out of this debate came a new and widely agreed reading of the lines that concerned Pan-Hellenic victors. Lines 11 to 18 are now restored as follows, and here I give you my translation of these lines. And all who have won at Olympia, at the Pythia, on the Isthmus or at, at Nemea, or shall win in the future, shall have Cetesis in the Pritoneion and the other gifts in addition to Cetesis, according to what is written on the stela in the Pritoneion. And all who have won with a horse-drawn chariot or racing horse at Olympia, at the Pythia, on the Isthmus or at Nemea, or shall win in the future, shall have Cetesis according to what is written on the stela. The last three lines of the inscription are two fragmentary to support a restoration, a certain restoration that is. Nonetheless, Wesley Thompson suggests that the decree went on to detail the public maintenance of their horses about the office of the generals. So that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is a lovely idea. We see here in this decree, the Athenians giving free dining to the humans who won at the Olympic Games, and they also give free dining to their horses as well. The other gifts of line 14 that undoubtedly include, included pro ed ria, that is front row seating at the state's dramatic, musical and sporting contests, which always accompanied Athenian grants of cetesis until the Roman period. Giving such honours to victorious sportsmen clearly predates this inscription itself, as the decree simply confirms grants of Cetesis that are described as traditional or already spelled out in an earlier inscription. Other Greek cities are known to have staged an a Selassis, a welcoming home ceremony for citizens who had been victorious at Pan-Hellenic Games. In this ceremony, a, a victor was showered with crowns, palm fronds, ribbons, clothes, no doubt underwear, and other personal gifts and conveyed in a chariot back to the city as part of a grand procession, which regularly culminated at the sanctuary of a local city protecting god or goddess, hero or heroine. Although we lack contemporary evidence putting the, the issue beyond doubt, the classical Athenians probably staged a comparable civic ceremony for their own Pan-Hellenic victors. For three Athenian authors, Aristophanes, Euripides and Thucydides, assumed that their audiences knew of ceremonial gift giving to homecoming athletic victors. Likewise, a Roman period so uh, source focuses on the Aeselasis of the Athenian Dioxippos after, he, after his Pankration victory at the Olympics of 336. We see. Such a lavish ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, helps to explain why Olympic victors were imagined to have the happiest of lives. This treatment of Olympic and other Pan Olympic victors is noteworthy and it requires careful explanation. Athenian democracy, for one, gave Cetesis and Pro Ed to, among others, victorious generals. Select as the descendants of Harmodius and Aristogiton, who were believed to have liberated the, the city from the Pisistrata tyranny. And, and politicians who had been judged to have outperformed others in their services to the city. Clearly, these recipients were civic benefactors of the highest order. 
the fact that Panhellenic victors were given the same, quote, very big gifts, unquote, and honours, unquote, unquote, tends to suggest that the Athenian demos, the Athenian people, judge them to have performed an unsurpassable public service. This is confirmed by the way in which public speakers discuss their own sporting victories or, their, uh, or, or, or those of their forebears. Among the tactics that Athenian litigants employed to win over the predominantly lower class jurors in Athenian democracy was the cataloguing of their public services. The agatha, the benefits that were regularly listed were festival and military liturgies, uh, festival and military public services, if you will, the payment of the ice fora, that is the emergency tax on the property of the elite for war, exemplary military service and acts of charity in aid of poor Athenians. However, ladies and gentlemen, if litigants could do so, they also mentioned Panhellenic sporting victories. For example, in defense of the late Alcibiades character, his son mentions not only his father's extraordinary track record as a liturgist and his winning of the first prize for military courage at Potidaea and his victories as a general, but also his chariot racing victory at the Olympics of 416 BC. For Demosthenes as well, this Panhellenic success along with his military victories were among the quote, good works, unquote, that Archibaldes had performed for the Athenian state. In another speech uh, in which a son has to defend his uh, dead father, liturgies and monetary aid for poor Athenians are mentioned alongside equestrian victories at the Isthmian and Nemean games. Finally, one of Demosthenes' clients desperately sought to create charis, that is a sense of obligation or a sense of gratitude in the jurors by trumpeting how his grandfather had won the stadion, that is the sprint race here at Olympia, um, while his grandfather's uncle, so you can feel his desperation here, this is, a, this is a, 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 a quite distant relative, while his grandfather's uncle had helped to restore the democracy in 411 BC. Clearly, lower class Athenians thought that the winners of Panhellenic Games were worthy of the same recognition as those citizens who had performed an extraordinary feat on the battlefield or in defense of Athenian democracy. One of the few scholars who have attempted to explain this extraordinary evaluation of Olympic and Panhellenic success more generally is the great classicist Leslie Kirk. She considers it to be part of what she calls, quote, the economy of kudos, unquote, in which the kudos of a Panhellenic victor was shared harmoniously with his city. For Kirk, kudos was a magical power which individuals acquired by sporting or military victory and could employ in the future to aid the military campaigns or colonial ventures of their polis, of their city-states. The songs, Kirk suggests, which were commissioned to praise the victory of a sportsman, consistently associated this magical power with the vegetational crown that he had won and the circulation of his kudos among fellow citizens with the dedication of this prize in a local sanctuary. In support of her theory, Kirk discusses historical episodes where polis apparently involved Panhellenic victors in risky foreign ventures in order to harness their magical power. Thus, according to Kirk, it was out of, out of a sense of gratitude for their sharing of this kudos, this magic, that Greek cities awarded Panhellenic victors so lavishly. So ladies and gentlemen, Kirk, Leslie Kirk published this theory in the 1990s and it took the ancient history world by storm. It was extremely 
influential. Everyone thought she was a, a genius to come up with this. And it's also an extraordinary theory. And she says, listen, uh, sportsmen, in fact, uh, uh, obtain magic at the Olympic Games. And because they shared that magic with the state, they were rewarded by their fellow citizens. So pretty out there, a pretty uh, um, extraordinary theory. And it also helped Leslie Kirk uh, uh, in around 2000 to win an Einstein Award in the United States. Leslie Kirk deserves credit for her nuanced explanation of the usually unexplained standing of Panhellenic victors. However, in the last several years, her theory has been increasingly called into question. In epic and epinician poetry, it is clear that kudos is not a power that individuals win and, and hence possess for the future. Rather, it is the discretionary help that a god or goddess grants a military leader or a competitor in a sporting argon so that he can defeat his opponents. Certainly, receiving such divine help may be a mark of distinction. It's a cool thing, but it is possessed only flittingly. And as Emile Benveniste famously observed, quote, the God grants it now to one and now to another at his good will, unquote. Moreover, in their victory songs for sportsmen, it is clear Achilles and Pindar associated the crown and the victory itself, much more frequently with the profane, much more frequently with the non-religious phenomena of doxa, good opinion, and kleos, renown, than they did with kudos. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, alternate explanations which make better sense of the surviving evidence can be made for the roles of Panhellenic victors in the historical episodes that Kirk highlighted. For example, the Spartan stations, stations such sporting victors next to one of their kings in battle because they probably judged this position to be a place of honour and also believed, as Plutarch suggests, that there was a close relationship between military and sporting performance. Moreover, they gave citizenship to Tisomenos of Elis as he was from a famous family of military seers and the Delphic Oracle had prophesied that he would win five great agones, five great contests, which the Spartans came to realize referred to battles rather than sporting games. Likewise, Phallos of Croton, one of the most famous Olympians of the classical period, likewise Phallos of Croton only had one warship when he brought help to the Greeks before the Battle of Salamis in 480, not as Kirk suggests because his magic was the substantive aid, but because he had financed and manned the warship himself, thank you very much, which was a long-standing practice of Greek aristocrats. And it was widely believed that even one or two warships constitu constituted valuable assistance in ancient Greek sea battles. Ladies and gentlemen, if magico religious considerations had no part to play in this remarkable honouring of sporting victors by a city, the only plausible explanation would appear to be the vic victory's political potential. From time to time, classical Athenians did mention the benefits of a Panhellenic victory for their polis. Their comments serve as an appropriate starting point for piecing together the substance of this political value. The fullest discussion of this topic occurs in a defence speech written by Socrates uh, uh, for Alcibiades the Younger, when he canvasses his father's unprecedented entering of, and again, I hope you're sitting down, of seven teams into the contest for four horse chariots at the Olympic Games of 416 BC. According to his son, Archibides the Elder was motivated to compete as lavishly as he did out of consideration of the political benefits that it would bring his Athenian police. Therefore, he, he saw that, 
quote, the Greeks made a, a display of wealth, power and education at this Pan-Hellenic festival. And that while athletic competitors were objects of envy, so too the cities of victors became on a mastai, they became renowned by name, unquote. In a roundabout way, his son suggests that Archibides thought Olympic competitors to be polis representatives. For he also believed it, it, it is said that liturgies at Athens, public services at Athens might have been performed, quote, in the name of private individuals before fellow citizens. But those at the Olympic festival were in the name of the city before all of Greece. Hopea tes polios, eis hapasan ten helada, unquote. Of course, this speaker's claims should be uh, uh, carefully evaluated, for Archibald's younger and Isocrates were not beyond falsifying for the sake of the defence, political history, and the motives of Archibald's elder for choosing equestrian over athletic contest. Nevertheless, on this topic, at least, other evidence appears to, to corroborate what he says. For example, a spawning victor was clearly identified with his polis at Pan-Hellenic Games. The Onoma, the name of his city or his city ethnic, was given pride of place in what you see here, in the proclamation, in the public proclamation of his victory immediately after his agon. This identification was reinforced by the commemorative statues of sporting victors that were set up at Olympia. Most of their inscribed epigrams identified his polis, while a few stated that the statue had been commissioned by the winner's own demos. These claims of Archibald's younger also correspond with what other Athenian litigants and what other Athenian writers for upper class readers had to say about the benefits of pan Hellenic success. For his part, for his part, for example, Thucydides had Alcibiades the Elder use almost identical terms, you have the terms on the screen, to justify his Olympic participation in an assembly speech. His participation brought doxa, good opinion to him and his family, and Ophelia, prophet, and Tirmea, worth to the city. In particular, Archibides argues in this speech, his entering of so many chariot racing teams and his lavish after party after his victory gave, quote, the Greeks, unquote, an impression of the dunamis, an impression of the military might of Athens that was greater that was actually the case after the costly Archidamian War. In a similar vein, Isocrates conceded that Pan-Hellenic victors created some doxa, some good opinion for their cities. In addition, one litigant, like Archibald's son, said that his father, by his equestrian victories at, at Ismia and Nemea, had brought Athens to Emea brought Athens worth, while another claimed that his grandfather, quote, by winning the stadion for boys at Olympia, had crowned the city, unquote. This last metaphor, which also figures in the epigrams of Victor's statues at Olympia, is ambiguous. As the Victor's crowning is public recognition of his victory, it, its meaning could be that the, uh, that, that the Panhellenic Victor recognizes his victory as his cities, or equally, that he makes his city victorious. Ladies and gentlemen, the classical Athenians, the classical Athenians seem to have lacked a conceptual language for describing the representation of a city or group by an individual, and hence struggled to explain succinctly the political potential of Pan-Hellenic victory. However, the claims which they did make, as Thomas 
Heiner Nielsen observes in this book imply that, quote, the athletic success of its citizens reflected back on the polis and that the Panhellenic festivals were not only competitions among individual athletes, but also among the polis, which they represented, unquote. Thus, they provide a classic example of what social scientists call the representational function of sport. A sporting event has this function when spectators believe that their race, religion, or more commonly their nationality is represented in the event against representatives of a rival group. And hence that the competition's outcome will impact on their standing relative to each other. This explains why sport is widely accepted as a legitimate opportunity for expressing national sentiment. And sportsmen are regularly treated as heroes who embody perceived national characteristics. The symbol symbolic meaning of this is further enhanced by the fact that in the world of competing sovereigns, the playing field is much more level than in the reality of military, political, or economic competitive processes. Here, all stand a real chance, even the smaller nation states who can occasionally enjoy the pleasure of defeating their bigger brothers. In consolidate, consolidated democracies such as Australia, the perceived advantage of such uh, international successes has been the main justification for the massive increase over the last few decades in the public subsidization of elite Olympic sport. Back to ancient Greece. In the ancient Greek world, the victory of one of its sportsmen was so politically valuable for Apollos because of the publicity that a Panhellenic festival gave this success. The games of these four festivals were the most popular in the Greek world, attracting enormous numbers of competitors, sacred ambassadors, and ordinary expectors from right across the Mediterranean and in time, even the Near East. The best attended games of the periodos or circuit was, of course, the Olympics, whose stadium of the mid fourth century could accommodate up to, again, I hope you're sitting down, 45,000 spectators. On the other hand, the other three panel games still attracted crowds in the tens of thousands and of comparable diversity. Consequently, whatever took place during these festivals or could be otherwise observed at their sites had the potential to become known to almost the entire Greek world as official polis representatives, athletes and spectators returned home and reported what they had seen. This helps to explain why the classical Athenians commonly said that, quote, the Greeks, unquote, in their entirety, attended or witnessed a celebration of the Olympic Games. Polis, ladies and gentlemen, carefully exploited this opportunity to gain nationwide publicity. They used the sanctuary, for example, to display peace treaties, or more regularly, and I find this really fascinating because it's very different from the modern Olympics, or more regularly, dedications of arms, sculpture or treasuries whose inscriptions advertise their military victories over each other. The lion's share of such dedications was set up at Olympia. The sitting embankments of the ancient Olympic Stadium have given us many more dedications of arm and uh, armor and weapons rather than any other Greek sanctuary or archeological site. While the text punched into one hel helmet found in the stadium indicates that it was taken by the Athenians from the horrible Persians at Marathon, most of the inscribed dedications on these arms celebrate the victories of Greeks over each other. 
Moreover, the depositional circumstances of these objects and the presence of actual post holes in the stadium indicate that they were once part of duplicate tropia, tropia, uh, duplicate trophies set up as thanks offerings for Zeus. At Olympia, it seems, Polis set up such victories, such trophies, because it helped them to secure nationwide publicity for their military victories and to express their sense of obligation to Zeus, that is the deity who was most responsible for military success. Olympia, therefore, became a field of propaganda for the great powers and its games a continuation of war by other means. Alternatively, victors used the tenth of the booty that had, had been that had been set aside for Zeus of Olympia to commission sculptures and buildings. For example, the victory by the sculptor Pan Pannonius, which originally sat atop a platform of nine meters in height before the Temple of Zeus, was set up by the Mycenaeans and the Naupactians after their victory as allies of Athens over the Spartans in 425 BC. Its inscription reads, quote, the Naupactians and the Mycenaeans dedicated to Zeus Olympios a tenth decatan of the booty taken from their enemies, unquote. In a similar manner, the Megarians used the spoils from a military victory of theirs over their neighbours, the Corinthians, to dedicate a so-called treasury in the late 6th or early 5th century. In view of the modern interpret, importantly, in view of the modern interpretation of the Olympics as a means of promoting peace, Helmut Kuriles concludes in this book, quote, it might come as a shock that the ancient Greeks used, of all places, a site of athletic competitions to display in front of, of tens of thousands of spectators, such martial reminders of armed conflict. But these archeological finds demonstrate that ancient Olympia cannot be understood from the perspective of the modern Olympic ideal. The dominant idea of ancient Olympia was not peace, but victory, both in sport and armed conflict. Thus, at the Olympic Games, at Pan Olympic Games rather, it was not just fellow citizens, but potentially all of the Greek world that came to know of the victory that Apollos had gained by the sporting, the sporting victory of one of its citizens. Such a victory gave cities of otherwise no importance, rare international prominence, and those that were regional powers, uncontested proof of the worth, the timere, that they claimed in relation to their neighbours and rivals. That Polis did view Panhellenic success as significant for their international relations is apparent in their reactions if one of their citizens seemed to be deprived of his victory unjustly. For example, in 322 BC, Callipus of Athens, who had been proclaimed the winner of the Olympic pentathlon, was judged by the Eleans to have bribed his opponents. Oops. And hence he was fined and disqualified by the Eleans, that is, the, uh, the organizers of the games. In response, Athens sent one of its foremost politicians, perhaps its, mo its foremost politician, Hyperides, as an ambassador, ambassador to try and have the judgment appealed. Hyperides did not succeed, and as a result, Athens boycotted the Olympics for the next 20 years. The only other way that Apollos had to raise its international stand ranking was to defeat a rival polis in battle. The outcome of such a contest was uncertain and could cost the lives of very many citizens. Therefore, classical Athens, like other polis, considered those of its citizens who had won an athletic or equestrian victory at Panhellenic Games to be civic benefactors of the highest order 
as they had, at their own expense, raised its standing and done so without the need of his fellow citizens to take to the battlefield. Cities, that is, were actually conscious of the potential of their athletes for their own self-advertisement. What also made them deserving of very big gifts and honours was that only a few of the city sportsmen ever gained a pan-Hellenic victory. In addition, these victors, if they had been athletes, have personally endured the ponoi, the toils, and the kindunoi, the dangers of athletic training and competition, and possessed the courage and the kudos, the divine aid that were required for athletic or military success. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, today, we still view Olympians as our representatives, and we are still part of an international system of competing states. Consequently, an important lesson from the ancient Olympics is that international sporting success does improve a state's standing. Therefore, the ancient Olympics do provide some justification for the state subsidization of our Olympic teams. Nevertheless, we must not push these parallels too far. For good or for ill, we are not ancient Greeks. International competition is no longer confined to sport and war. New bodies such as the G20, the OECD and the World Health Organization also rank states in terms of education, health and vaccination rates. In this new world order, we will only hold our ranking if we spend just as much on our doctors, our nurses and our teachers. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, David. That was a superb lecture. My name is Craig. My my name's Craig Barker. I'm the um, um, head of public engagement. My apologies. I'm coming to you from the darkness, but I'm currently trying to put my five-year-old to sleep. Because no problem. Of lockdown. Um, but uh, uh, for everyone listening at home, um, I think we've just had a lovely demonstration of why David's scholarship has been so highly regarded. Um, both here in Australia and internationally, that was a, a, a superb um, uh, uh, overview of um, you know, decades of scholarship, as, as David's pointed out. Um, David's very kindly offered to answer any questions from listeners. And so what I'm going to ask people to do is to use the chat function. If you do have a question for David, and then I will read it out on your behalf. Um, so please um, jump on right now if you do have a question. While we're waiting for people to, to do so, David, one thing I just want to, um, yep. to um, ask you very quickly, and that's the concept of fame for the athletes. Um, in, in my circle of studying theatre, um, of course, there were a number of actors in the Hellenistic and Roman periods who, of course, became internationally famous, well beyond their home polis, and, and indeed you know, would often, often tour as well. Um, to gain that level of notoriety outside of your home polis, obviously the Olympics is, is one of the key ways to do so, but how were athletes regarded internationally, you know, not just in terms of their hometown, but if they were to travel, were they garlanded as well as, as a champion? Look, it's a, it's a very good question, uh, Craig. So look, um, there are famous Olympic athletes like uh, uh, Milo of Croton or Phallus of Croton, and these, uh, these uh, athletes won hundreds, if not uh, thousands of prizes around the Greek world. And what's interesting about them is that they traveled extensively. So they kind of were, were permanently on the road, traveling between Pan-Hellenic Games, but also participating in many, many local competitions. Uh, uh, I've spoken tonight about the four big uh, international games that were very important. But there were hundreds of other 
local games that uh, individual polis put on as well. And we know that some of the Olympic victors also participated in them very frequently indeed. Indeed, it's also pretty clear as well that um, polis, in fact, wanted to, to attract international uh, competitors as well. We know at the Great Panathenaia, a, a games that was comparable to the Panhellenic Games. The Athenians had open competitions for foreigners as well. That's very clear. In addition, um, um, uh, it's very clear that, uh, that international um, sportsmen, in fact, did have a following well beyond their polis. So the Athenians were very interested in Milo of Croton. They were very interested in a Phalos of Croton as well. Um, some questions coming through on the, the Q&A function and on the chat function, so I invite people to do so. Stephen Mills has um, pointed out that here in Australia, of course, Cappy Freeman's win at Sydney was regarded as a great win, not just for Australia as a nation, but also for Indigenous Australians. Are there any comparable examples of, um, of not just political citizenship, but also identity being important in the celebration of victory at the ancient games? Let's see. So it's a very important question. So, um, so let's see. So my answer really is that um, at the Paralympic Games, it was the it was your nationality which was very significant. So when you won at Olympia, people didn't say, "Well done, uh, you, you, you're a Dorian competitor." They said, "Well done." You're a Spartan comp competitor, and Sparta is proud of what you do. So that's pretty clear, and that's pretty consistent. So uh, we uh, let's see. So in the Greek world, um, ethnicity is a complicated thing, uh, but the primary ethnic identification in the Greek world was with one's polis, was what with one's microstate. That's the main connection. A second uh, ethnic identity will concern groups of people, but that was less prominent at the Olympic Games. Hmm. Now, Joanne has asked a very interesting question. Uh, did other countries outside of the Greek polis um, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the identity of the Greek city-states, were they able to join the ancient Olympic Games? Look, it's a, it's a very good question. So, in, uh, alas, one of the entry requirements for competing at the Olympic Games was that you needed to have trained for at least a month before you know to train at olympia for a month before competing another requirement is that you had to be greek and this was very important but what's interesting is that um is that the borders of the greek world got wider and wider uh, throughout the hellenistic age and uh, throughout the uh, uh, roman empire and so very distant new greek cities in the near east would in time in fact, send competitors to the Olympic Games. In addition, it's very clear that this Olympic culture was taken up by these new cities in the Near East as well, because they, in fact, um, they in fact convened local games that they said were Olympic-like games. So, as the Greek world expanded, the oikomene, the Greek civilization expanded. So did the pool from which Olympic competitors were drawn. Um, Kate asks, what class were athletes um, other than three men? Well, yeah, could athletes uh, look, come from other? Kate, it's a great question. And look, uh, look, I've been involved in a heated debate about the class background of athletes for about 20 years. Uh, and uh, look, I, I think that athletes came from the upper class uh, and that athletics was something that upper class people did to differentiate themselves from the hoi polloi. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, sport was only accessible to, uh, for them because only they had the free time uh, to spend on training for athletic competition. Uh, in addition, only, only they had the money to pay for athletics teachers. The state didn't pay for athletics teachers. You had to pay for your own PE classes as well. And finally, it seems to me a part of the elite lifestyle in archaic and classical Greece was being a sportsman. And so, you needed to show a connection with sport in, in order to prove your, uh, your upper class membership. So, that, the, so, so let's see. So Olympic competitors were elite in two senses. They were highly trained sportsmen, but they also belonged to the social elite of the ancient Greek world. 
Um, Athanasius's question is is very much related to that as well about were there any exclusions as to who was able to compete in the Olympics and I, I suspect you've answered that one in that previous answer but um, it's a very interesting point isn't it that uh, that's that's right so look so let's see so it's different from today so uh, you'd get you, you do get some subsidization of uh, of uh, non elect participation but it comes very late it comes in Hellenistic times as well. Um, it was possible, uh, so in order to compete at the Olympic Games, you needed to be Greek. Um, uh, 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 in practical terms, you needed to belong to the social elite. Uh, in addition, the Eleans, the, uh, the, the uh, people that organized the, organized the games for a thousand years, they could actually exclude different states from the games as well. And they did that from time to time because of wars that they had engaged in, or because of the fact that they didn't like particular states at, at particular in particular periods of time. Um, Gail asks, "How do we know that the four cities, or rather, how do we know how the four cities were initially decided upon as locations for the Panhellenic Games? Was there any historical process as to why these particular games got elevated above any other?" Look, it's a, look, it's a very good question, Gail. And uh, look, and it's, it's a very good question, but it's a hard question to answer. So let's see. So it seems, let's see. So games really started at Olympia uh, around um, traditional date is 476, but that's considered probably too early on the basis of archaeological evidence, i.e. the wells in the stadium. A better date would be around 700 BC. And then the three other panel games uh, really appeared uh, in the seventh and the sixth centuries. I think, let's see, it was very prestigious to have games that everybody wanted to attend. So I imagine there would have been uh, some sort of competition. But by about, by about 550, the Greeks had kind of uh, agreed that while there were many important local games, the four big ones that you should really attend were those games uh, that I mentioned today. Um, Gail also adds, uh, thank you for um, the introduction of the Odes of Pindar and Alcib Alcibiades. Um, and also a, a big thank you for uh, letting her escape from the lockdown blues, which I, okay, I good, for good. one, will second. And I suspect that quite a few other people listening in would also um, uh, like to thank you for taking us to Greece temporarily as well. Patrick raises, uh, I suspect, one of the perennial questions you and other researchers of ancient games gets asked, which is about female participation. Um, did females participate in the games? And if so, what differences were there between male and female competitors? Okay, let's see. So uh, the, 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 uh, there is a very short answer, no. And so women were excluded from competition uh, and att uh, at the Olympic Games, they weren't allowed to be spectators either, period. Um, and so the Games were very much a male affair. Uh, that's also the case at the other panel competitions. Uh, indeed, uh, look, uh, female participation in sport um, uh, is a great, a great topic. It's uh, worth further uh, research, but it differed from different places in the Greek world. So. I've spent most of my career studying democratic Athens and democratic Athens, uh, women did not participate in any organized uh, sport whatsoever. Uh, that was that. They may have participated in a ritual race uh, um, uh, at Brauron, but that's about it. They otherwise didn't compete in any sporting activity at all. And a reason for that was that as far as most Greek men were concerned, women were never courageous, they were never very good at bearing the toils and the dangers of sport and war. And as a sportsman needed to be courageous, to bear dangers and toils, uh, and as women couldn't do these things, they were not actually, uh, not actually moral, morally capable to be sportswomen. The big exception here, uh, it's a very striking exception, is ancient Sparta. Uh, ancient Sparta is very different in that uh, ancient Sparta, in fact, encouraged elite girls to go to physical education classes uh, in the athletics field or in wrestling skills and to, uh, and to participate 
in sporting competitions for girls and young women. So Sparta, Sparta is a bit a big, a big exception. And the reason for this is Sparta's uh, unusual social structure in that Sparta was reorganized in the late archaic period to be this uh, um, military, high, high performance military state. And it was felt that uh, they wanted uh, fit wives, they wanted muscular wives, uh, because they felt that this would ensure that those wives would give birth to healthy, muscular uh, boys to serve in the Spartan army. So Sparta is a great outlier here. In general, uh, women uh, had little to do with organized support in the ancient Greek world. Thank you, David. I think the, the final question for the evening comes from Kate. Did um, uh, were, were uh, team um, events included from the very beginning of the uh, ancient games, or was it always yes. individual contests? It's a look at the, Kate. It's a really good question because let's see. At these four big Panhellenic games, the competitions were only for individuals. Uh, so it was a very individual, individualistic thing. What's interesting though is that the Athenian state had, had an extensive program of sporting festivals. Uh, and these festivals were introduced in the first 50 years of Athenian democracy. And what's interesting about Athenian festivals is that there were very many team events. There were many team events. Perhaps the most famous team event in Athenian sport was the torch race. Uh, and so there was a torch race at the Great Panathenaia and at three other Athenian festivals. And this is the, uh, it was a relay race where teams passed a, 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 a lit torch from, a lit baton from one uh, team member to another. And it was very important. But there were other team events. For example, at the Great Panathenaia, there was a warship race. Uh, there were um, that there were, there were competitions involving units of the cavalry corps as well. So Athenian sport is different from Panhellenic sport in that it had a lot of team events and the presence of team events at Athens is probably directly related to Athenian democracy. Athens was a democracy where, in, uh, where teams were important, where you often worked as part of teams and so that was reflected in the sporting culture of this state. Thank you, David. And thank you for the time to answer those questions. Um, this has been a, a magnificent talk. Um, this is not how we wanted to be doing our public program series at the moment, but um, uh, David very, very kindly at, at very last minute um, offered uh, to assist us with this wonderful talk. So I'd like to invite everybody to, um, to digitally and virtually thank you, uh, or pass on their thanks to David. Um, it's been a great privilege and pleasure hearing you uh, today. And um, I think giving us some context as well. Um, I know my little one, not quite falling asleep just yet, but he's very, very excited about the Olympics starting. Um, and again, um, just that concept and, and the image you showed of Olympia, just the idea of the roar of the crowd. 45,000 more that we're gonna get in Tokyo next week, but um, it, it just gives an insight of, of just how that competitive nature is so important to ancient society as well as modern. So thank you so much, David. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen listening in, um, I would like to invite you to join more of our Chow Chak Wing Museum Lockdown Series talks. On Thursday night, our curator Jan Brazier is presenting on female photographers of New South Wales in the late 19th century, which promises to be a really, really interesting talk. And on Thursday at lunchtime next week, a very, very special event associated with our Jowkery exhibition. So to find out more, visit the uh, Chow Chak Wing Museum website at sydney.edu.au forward slash museum. Otherwise, I wish everyone the very best of uh, luck during lockdown. A very good night to everybody. And once again, thank you very much, Associate Professor David Pritchard. Thank you. Good night.